Hey Cherubs, so if you've been administering mental status screening tests for a while, you've probably hit a point in which they become really difficult to perform. And what's the point in spending half an hour trying to administer a mocha to a patient who can't speak? This is why we have the FAST skill. Instead of doing cognitive testing, we can just ask about a patient's ADLs and IADLs. It's literally FAST, and you can ask a family member or caregiver. At the top of the scale, we have complex executive functioning tasks. In Alzheimer's disease, patients slowly lose the ability to perform their IADLs, and when you cross the line from stage 5 to stage 6, they start to lose their ADLs. It's kind of like pediatric milestones, but backwards. And that makes sense, because if there's one thing I learned from peds, it's that kids are just small adults. Now you may be thinking, what's the point? Why you gotta attach a number to everything? Well, this makes a difference when you're trying to enroll a patient in hospice. In general, one of the criteria for dementia enrollment is stage 7C dementia, in which your patient has lost the ability to walk. Like I said with the other tests, remember to use your clinical judgment when applying this tool. For example, you remember that time Rachel pushed me off the ledge and I broke my legs and couldn't walk? That doesn't mean I have stage 7C dementia. Stage 7C means that I can't walk because I lack the cognitive ability to do so. Be wary, especially if you have a patient who seems to be losing abilities out of sequence. That's why in my case, it took them a while to figure out that I don't actually have dementia. At baseline, I don't know how to pick out which diapers I should be wearing. Now, if you've been paying attention to this form, you pretty much have the natural history of Alzheimer's laid out for you. You'll forget how to take care of yourself. You'll forget how to speak, how to walk, and how to swallow. And on average, most patients will die in about four to eight years. Now that you're scared, your first thought is probably, what can we do to treat this? Unfortunately, not much. Take the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, one of the mainstays of pharmacotherapy. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter, a chemical signal that allows nerves to talk to each other. These chemicals pass between neurons in a junction called the synapse. You can think of a synapse as a bowl and acetylcholine as part of the soup. Acetylcholinesterase is an enzyme that eats the soup, so acetylcholinesterase inhibitors keep more soup in the bowl. Okay, that's great. But if you were paying attention, your next question should be, so what does that have to do with plaques and tangles? Turns out that the answer is nothing. So yeah, these meds are garbage. They don't modify the underlying pathophysiology of the disease, so at best they delay the progression of the symptoms. The changes won't be dramatic. You shouldn't expect patients to start recovering their memories, and the improvement is often so subtle that we say that it's statistically significant, but not necessarily clinically significant. The American Geriatric Society actually says that if you don't see any kind of benefit within 12 weeks, you may as well stop taking these meds. Mimantine works by a different mechanism of action, but it's also not an amazing medication. Unfortunately, Alzheimer's doesn't have a blockbuster medication like atorvastatin or metformin, and nothing in the pipeline has panned out. So now you should be even more worried. Well, if we can't treat the disease, then we need to prevent it. Unfortunately, the greatest risk factor for the general population is age and we're not fixing that anytime soon. Now, you can probably go on the internet and find someone who will tell you how to prevent Alzheimer's. Take this herbal supplement. Play more Sudoku. Brush your teeth! While I won't discourage you from flossing, I'll say that medicine currently doesn't know how to prevent Alzheimer's disease. And if I did know the answer, you can bet that I'd be patenting it and stuffing it into a bottle as fast as I could. So at this point, you may be asking yourself, what's the point? We can't prevent it? We can't treat it? We're doomed! We're all gonna die! Why bother even talking about it? Well, there are a lot of things that we can do to mitigate the effects. We want to avoid situations in which a patient rolls into the hospital and we discover that he's no longer safe to be at home, but he's never had any kind of discussion regarding plans and goals. Are there advanced healthcare directives in place? Will any of the family members be willing to help take care of the patient? Is the patient willing to live in a nursing home in the future? These are all important questions that we'd ideally like to have answered well in advance in non-emergent settings when the patient's cognition is still relatively intact. Medicine is full of chronic, incurable diseases, and even if we can't fix all of them, or even most of them, we can still make the last chapter in someone's life as comfortable and as dignified as possible, and I think that's one of the most powerful things that can be accomplished in medicine. And it's not something that I can do alone. It's going to require an interprofessional team. I'm going to need your help. Again, with these medications at my disposal, I'm actually not very useful. 
So thank you so much for everything that you do in the service of others and for taking the time to help address one of the greatest medical problems of our time. Best wishes to you, Cherubs. And thank you so much for inviting me to your graduation. You're great listeners, you know that?